uh, LP solution for this aggregate planning problem. And I have just uh, created a table here, which is uh, well similar to what we have also seen with the other, the extreme strategies. And we have the demand here. Sorry, to June. And we know that we should adjust the demand. This is the forecast, which should be adjusted by the ingoing inventory, 500, and the outgoing inventory of 600. So we only need to produce 780 in January, but then we have to produce uh, to meet the demand of, six, uh, of uh, 2,000 in, in June. And we can make the table of the cumulative demand, which is 780 plus 640 uh, will be 1420 plus 900 and 1200. So this is the cumulative demand, the demand that we need to meet up to that particular month. And solving this uh, LP problem to optimality, then we can see that we find the solution here, which gives us an objective value of 379,320.9, which is found by looking at the workforce or the variable values here. Workforce is said to be 300 when you start the planning period. And then we are reducing to 272.9 with conservative rounding. We remember, round the workforce up to the closest integer, which means that we should have 273 people employed. That will also mean that we need to fire 27 in January. And then the same number will remain constant for month two, three, and four, and then we have to adjust again in month number five. So here, 273. And then in month number five, the LP solution tells us to have 737.73, which means that we have to run upwards to 738. And that means we need to hire 465 in May. And this will also be the situation in month number six, 738. So no changes from month five to six. So now this strategy will now give us 465 hiring and 27 firing during this six month period. Only in two months we have to adjust the, the workforce. Uh, we can find the exact production by multiplying the workforce by the number for each month shown here, here because this is found by using the k-factor and multiplying by the number of working days for each of the six months. Then we can multiply this number for each month by the w value for the, the similar month, which is now what is shown in this column. And then we will have a production of 800 in January. We will have 960 in February, 720, 1040, 2379, and 1622. And we can also make a table or, or a column of the cumulative production, the production up to that month. And 
comparing with the cumulative demand here, we can also see what is the excess production, how much have we left on inventory. And producing 800 to a demand of 780 will give us 20 items left on stock. And then 1760 compared to 1420 will give us uh, 340. And 28. 2480 compared to 2320 is 160. Exactly zero in April, 3520. And then 379 and one extra on stock in the end of June. Which means total of uh, 900. And now we can find the cost of this strategy, which is uh, the LP with conservative rounding. Let's call it that. Um, we remember the LP solution where you were allowed to have fractional values, which gave us a cost of 379,320.9. We also remember the extreme strategies of zero inventory and conservative rounding, which was about 580,000 or so on, something like that. Now, the cost here will be the number of hiring, 465, multiplied by 500, plus 27 firing, multiplied by 1,000. And plus an inventory of 900 multiplied by 80. But we also need to uh, include the 600, which is meant to be on stock at the end of the, uh, of the planning period. So these 600, they are a part of the demand, but they are still on stock. So we need to pay the uh, storage cost or the the inventory cost for these 600. Which gives us a total of 379,500. Which is not very far away from the LP solution. So this is probably the best or the optimal solution, the optimal integer solution where you have integer values only allowed to employ people in a 100% uh, position. So this is very close to the LP solution, but this, this is not always the case. And this solution found by conservative rounding uh, might not always be the optimal solution for an IP and integer program. Uh, but usually it will be close to the optimal solution, so it is possible if you are not uh, able to, uh, to find or use uh, other mathematical techniques to find the exact optimal solution. A solution with, uh, with conservative rounding will usually be uh, sufficient. So here we have seen different strategies of solving the same problem. The problem about aggregate planning and production. Uh, we had one extreme strategy according to a constant workforce. Find out how many people do you need to, to have employed to meet the cumulative demand for any of the month, to be sure that you are actually producing enough to not have a stock out in any of the month. We have another extreme strategy, which is trying to produce exactly what you need to have so-called zero inventory or as close to zero as possible inventory, and then you will not have much inventory cost, but you have to hire and fire people to meet the demand for each month. And we have found a solution, the fractional solution, by solving an LP model in a solver like Lingo, and then finding a possible integer solution by using conservative rounding, and rounding the workforce to the closest integer 
and always need to run upwards to make sure that this is a feasible solution. And as mentioned, this problem is also quite similar to the problem in your assignment. Uh, and there you have also some other constraints. So in the last sub-questions on uh, problem two, you need to add some other constraints here. Because it's uh, always possible to add more constraints. Say that the workforce limit uh, is uh, uh, should be, uh, or the workforce should always be smaller than or equal to a certain number, or any other uh, constraints which you have to to add to make this uh, to, to add some other constraints and restriction to to the problem. So that was all about linear programming. And then we will continue to what we call inventory control subject to deterministic or known or fixed demand, which means that you always will know the rate of the demand and you should make plans according to a constant rate. The opposite or the other type of inventory control models are found when you have so-called stochastic or uncertain demand, when you don't know the exact demand and then you need to adjust or make some other models. And this will be described later in chapter number five. <coughs> So we have now finished chapter two about forecasting. We have finished chapter three about aggregate planning and then also on the supplement to chapter three about linear programming. And then chapter four will be the next. Inventory control subject to known or deterministic demand, which means how, uh, well in, in, uh, in short, we will find out how large batches should we order each time to minimize cost, or eventually how, m how large uh, batches should, should we produce to minimize the cost, which is a very similar but not exactly like problem. And um, this is some kind of, yeah, also called the classical inventory control. You need to find some kind of balance because if you are producing too much, you will have large costs. And when you have, uh, you will have a large stock, you will produce more than you actually need and store until later. And having a large stock will also mean that you will have high cost according to storage. Uh, so uh, in general, it's better to invest money otherwise than invest it in a large stock. But there will also be a balance because if you have to order very frequently, if you want to have have the stock level at the, at the low level. You need to order more frequently and there are also costs uh, which is uh, related to, to ordering. So then you need to find a balance about ordering cost and holding or storage cost. Uh, we have, we can see this as uh, uh, some kind of line with two opposites. And one extreme strategy here will then be to order everything you need once, according to what you need in a given time uh, period or a, a given uh, time horizon. So here, if you are planning for six months, as we have seen uh, in the previous examples, then you should order everything you need for the coming six months once. Then you have small ordering cost. But you will have a very large inventory level and a very large holding cost. So 
So you will have a very high inventory level at the start of the time horizon, and then of course you will use more and more of, of that inventory uh, until you, you, you reach uh, zero at the end of the horizon. But you will have very large holding cost at the start of this period, but then also very small holding cost. Uh, the other opposite strategy is to order everything exactly when you need it. Which means you can split into smaller time periods, you can split into months, you can even split into weeks and days, and say that, okay, today I have to order what I need for today. And then of course you will have not much hauling cost because you, you don't have a large stock, but you will have ordering cost for every day, which usually will be quite high. And usually the optimal uh, solution will be somewhere between here. Uh, of course, in some strategies, in some markets, it will be so large holding cost that you should, you should not, uh, not order more than you actually need. If you are building uh, well, ships, for example, you, you are not uh, storing many ships, so you will usually order uh, or start uh, producing uh, a ship when you actually get the order. So we will not have a large order, or large holding cost of ships which is not sold. But if you are uh, producing small items uh, which, is, uh, which don't have very high uh, holding cost, then you usually will have a strategy where you can, uh, you can buy more items than you actually need and store some of them to later. Um, we have, uh, we are also talking about different types of inventory. Uh, in a production company, you might talk about raw materials, which is the materials you need for production. Uh, you talk about components, small components, which is used as a part of the larger products. We are talking about uh, what we call the, the work in uh, process or things which is not finished. It can be some kind of what, uh, what is also called the sub-assembly, uh, which is uh, partly finished products. And we are also talking about finished goods. And we might have a stock for all these types of inventory. We can have stock of raw materials, we can have a stock of finished goods, but we can also have a stock of components and partly finished uh, products. And the strategy can also vary for each of these types of, uh, uh, of inventory. Uh, we yeah, go through some theory first, reasons for holding inventory. Shown here, economy of scale, cost of placing orders. Uh, you have the setup cost of machines, which is similar. Uh, if you are producing yourself, you have some kind of cost when setting up a machine to produce that particular product. Machines can usually produce several types of products and the setup cost will be similar to the ordering cost when you are ordering from an external vendor. So here, when you have economy of scale, for holding, well, one, one reason for holding inventory is the economy of scale, is that you can uh, produce in larger batches and also you can buy more than you actually need and also get some discount for large orders. Uh, uncertainty in delivery lead time is also one reason. You don't always know exactly how much time it will take from you place one order un until you get the delivery. That might be dependent of uh, several uh, issues, which is out of your control. And then it's usually one, uh, one reason is that uh, for have energy is to, to um, try to uh, deal with that uncertainty. Uh, speculation changes cost over time. Uh, well, the prices may vary, and uh, if you 
have a good offer about uh, a very low price for one of the products you, you need, then you should usually buy more than you might have planned for uh, because of, of the, the costs are, are low at that particular time. But then of course you need to, you will have cost which is uh, uh, for storing that, uh, that inventory, but since the price might be, be lower, these costs might also be lower than using the, the traditional plan of, of a certain ordering frequency. Uh, yeah, also one thing which is not mentioned here, transportation materials in transport will also often be considered as inventory. Uh, this might be significant when the transport time is high. For example, if you are importing things from Japan with a boat, it might take months. Uh, and then the inventory or the uh, materials in transport will often then be con considered as inventory. Uh, smoothing is another reason here. Uh, smoothing means that uh, trying to to smooth or have a smooth production, try to uh, have the same production rate over time, uh, which is quite similar to the constant workforce strategy we have talked about. Some products might have a seasonal demand. There could be peak periods, winter sport equipment, for example, skis, and so on, um, will be sold uh, much often, uh, much more in, in the winter than in the summer season. And then you could produce, to have a smooth production, you should produce for stock in the summer month, and then you will have a stock for sale in the winter month. Uh, we also talk about uh, yeah. Logistics, constraints in purchasing or distribution may force the system to man maintain some inventories. And then the purchase in uh, batches of predefined sizes, for example, is not always possible to buy exactly the amount that you want. You might have uh, batches of 1,000 items or a certain a full truckload, for example. Uh, so sometimes you need, uh, you can only buy in a pre define number of, uh, of, of items. And that is also one reason for holding uh, inventory, that you cannot buy exactly what, what you want, but you need to, to deal with some certain predefined batches. Um, we can also talk about uh, control costs, which is uh, that the system with a high degree of inventory control will need a smaller stock of inventory and there will also be cost to maintain and control over inventory. So cost of uh, maintaining the control system. Of course demand uncertainty is uh, certainly a reason for holding inventory and we will come back to that when we get to chapter 5 in, in, the, in the textbook which deals with the uh, inventory control system with stochastic, when you have a stochastic or uncertain demand. So, let's also talk about these characteristics of inventory system. The demand might be known at a fixed rate or uncertain. That's one characteristic and which will, will also decide which uh, strategy or which model of inventory control you should use. And the demand may might also be changing or it will be constant over time which is something you need to uh, deal with when you are making up a, a, an inventory strategy. Lead time is another characteristic. Time from you place an order until the goods is arrived at your stock. Sometimes the lead time is known. You know that it will take exactly one week. And sometimes it is unknown. There are some kind of uncertainty here, which is out of your control. And this is also something you need to uh, deal with when you are making up a strategy. Review time, another thing, uh, is the system reviewed periodically or is the system state known at all times? Do you have a computer managed stock that you can just push one button and get the exact amount of inventory on stock, which is the 
system state known at all time, or do you have some kind of periodically review that every week you will have a new, uh, uh, you will get the, the, the state at that time, but you will not always know the exact amount. So this is also something to deal with, when you are, uh, which are some characteristics which you need to, to handle in your inventory strategy. So, something we need to, we will also see examples on here, the treatment of the excess demand. What will happen if you have a demand, if a customer come to your store and want to buy an item which you don't have on stock? And then, one possible treatment is what we call the back order that you are able to register that order and deliver later. If you are buying a car, you will usually be uh, willing to, to wait uh, a few weeks to get exactly the car that you want. Uh, some other products, you will lose all the excess demand. If you don't have it, then the customer will go to the neighboring store and buy it there. And you have some variants in between there, something, some a certain amount of the customers will be uh, willing to wait for a back order, but some you will lose. They will go to another and buy something else. So this treatment will, of course, uh, of the excess amount will, will, of course, be very important when you should make up a strategy, and this will be uh, will depend how much will you actually lose. Will you lose? all the excess demand? Will you lose the profit of products which is not sold? Or will you just have some kind of penalty of keeping access of uh, all, the, um, uh, all the back orders which you should be able to deliver later when you get the, ne the next delivery from your vendor? And another thing here is the, what, uh, the inventory that changes over time. We talk about food and the perishable uh, food they might not be possible to store food for a longer period. At some time, they, it will not be uh, possible to, to eat, or at least not be possible to, to sell it. So you will have a certain uh, time period, which is the maximum allowed period to store inventory. And that will also be very important when you should put up an inventory system. So you cannot store items longer than a certain time period. And a typical example there is food. Uh, we can also talk about uh, obsolescence, which is products which is uh, out of fashion, for example. You can sell it for a certain time period, but then there will be new products or a newer versions of the same products. So it's no need to, to store or, or you should not store products longer than the period which uh, this is supposed to be uh, well, actual for, for sale. A uh, typical example here, uh, well, uh, lots of possible examples, but fashion industries, and there could be a new and improved version of, uh, uh, of the product. And also there could be new type of products that actually is better than or, or uh, will, will take over the, the market share of the current products. After the computer came, for example, no one will buy, or at least very few, will buy a traditional typewriter anymore. <coughs> so, let's now talk a bit of the relevant costs. And uh, one type of relevant cost, which we will deal with here, is the holding cost. And the holding cost in this case is the cost which is proportional to the quantity of inventory held. And here we have four different examples of what is included in the holding cost. This could be other uh, examples too, but here the physical cost of space. If you are storing an inventory or a storage area, that might be costly and it could be a uh, cost which is r uh, related to the quantity or the number of inventory held. In this example, 3% of the value of the item. Taxes and insurance is another part of the holding cost. In this case, said to be 
the possibility of breakage, spoilage, and deterioration uh, could also happen, and then you should uh, de uh, deal with uh, that uh, probability for some reason. And then in this case, 1% of the stock will be broken or deteriorated. And then we can also have uh, the last part, which is the opportunity cost of alternative investment, which usually is the largest part of the holding cost. This is also called the internal interest rate. And in this example, this is said to be 18%. This will be the alternative of investing in the inventory. You could put the money in uh, the bank and get some interest. You could invest otherwise in so something else. Investing in inventory is not usually a very good investment. So this will now be the opportunity cost, the interest rate, the internal interest rate, which is usually the largest part of the holding cost. In this case, you have four different parts and a total of 24% holding cost. And yeah, since the inventory may be changing on a continuous basis, the holding cost will be proportional to the area under the inventory curve. And then you might have an inventory curve, which might look like this. And then the area under this curve will be uh, the uh, will be the size of the stock over time. And then this is the amount that should be paid holding cost for. In our examples or in, in our uh, uh, models, we will have a known or so-called deterministic demand, which means that at least in the simplest example, we will order up to one point, which we can call the Q. This is the number of items we are ordering. And then we will have a constant demand rate, which means that the stock will be reduced at the same rate until we reach zero. And then we will have a new delivery of exactly Q items. And similar at the same rate. And this will now uh, be a, a graph of the stock level according to our strategy. And then we have the holding cost which can be said to be, on average, the half of the Q level. Since you have a fixed or known or, or fi fixed demand here at the same rate, the average level of the stock is one half of the order size. Here, it will first be larger than the average, and then it will be lower than the average. So this is a way to calculate the holding cost in this case with a deterministic or fixed demand rate, then use the average level, which is half of the ordering size. <coughs> then we can also talk about the ordering cost, which uh, is uh, shown here to be uh, either the ordering or production cost. We have both a fixed and a variable component. The fixed component is here denoted as the capital K, this number. This is the cost uh, uh, coordinate. And the fixed cost of placing one order is at this particular level, denoted as the K. And then you have a variable cost, which is dependent on the slope or the C which is the value of the product. So here, the ordering cost is the K, the fixed, uh, fixed cost of placing one order, and the value of the product multiplied by the number of products in one order. And this number is quite important here, because if you have a fixed rate, the total cost of item, the total purchase cost, this C, this slope, 
will will uh, will actually be the total will be the same if you have a fixed rate, a known rate, independent on the ordering strategy. So what is important, at least for the simplest models we will look at first, is the balance between the ordering cost and the holding cost. <coughs> Uh, we also should uh, mention this cost, which we'll come back to later, or I will also have one, one uh, small example uh, on this one. Uh, what we call the penalty or shortage cost, which is the cost that is, uh, will uh, accrue when insufficient stock is available to meet the demand. And this could include the loss of revenue for a lost demand. You will not get the... Uh, the profit of selling that product, which can be uh, denoted as a cost. The cost of bookkeeping for back-ordered demands. You need to keep track of the back-ordering, which will be delivered when you get the product back on stock. Another thing which is not very easy to measure, but is very important, the loss of goodwill for being unable to satisfy the demand when they occur. If the customer come to your store and you're out of stock, then you might not come back ever. And also, in general, assume that, that the cost is proportional to the number of units of excess in demand. So, let's now try to look at one example. Uh, I will use the uh, numbers in problem 4.8 on page 209, where we have a certain uh, demand for six different months and uh, we will now look at the different cost or the different ways of calculating the cost according to different types of, uh, uh, of, of policy or different types of market. <coughs> Uh, so here we have uh, six months and we also can uh, we are also given some kind of inventory uh, or, or in, in, in going balance the IB and then we start on month one two three four five and six we have a certain number of items received from your vendor which you should be able to, to sell to, to your customers. You have uh, the inventory or the items, number of items, which is 480 at the start of this period. And then you will have 200 received in, uh, in month number one, January. And then you get 175. 750, 950, 500, and 2050. And you have also a demand from your customers, which is 520 in January. And then a large demand in February, 1640, 670, 425, 280, and 550. So now let's uh, see what will happen with the different strategies. First, with the backlogging when you are, uh, or backordering when you are able to deliver the items at a later stage. Or second, with a lost sale when you actually will lose the sale when you don't have the items on stock.
end inventory and the first uh, can be what we yeah, go through that before we take the break. Lost sales. Then you will have an end inventory of 160 in January. You have 480 and you will get 200, which means a total of 680. And you have a demand of 520, which means that you have 160 items on stock. In February, you have 160, you get 175. But here you have a very large demand of 1640, which means that you have nothing left on stock and you will lose the profit of selling 1,305. And then we get 750 and we have a uh, demand of 680 and since month, uh, the February month are the only month where you have more demand than the actual uh, number of items on stock, you will have enough uh, demand or enough uh, items to, to meet the demand for the coming month. So you will have 80, 605, 825 and 2325. So this is now what will happen when you have a uh, lost sale uh, situation for the end inventory. When you have a large demand and you are not able to meet that demand, you will have a lost sale in this case of 1,305. Which means you will uh, have uh, Lose 1,305 multiplied by the profit. And also, of course, the loss of goodwill in this situation. Okay, then let's take a break, 15 minutes, and then we continue with this example when we will also look at the back ordering uh, situation with the same numbers.